Let's pray. Father, we pray now as we turn to your word that you would bless this time. Father, give me the strength to preach and the words to, to speak, and I pray you'd open our hearts to hear, Lord, just what you would have for us today. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 11. Listen as I read. 1 Timothy 1, 11 says, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. This, this verse is actually an incomplete sentence. It's connected to the verses before it and meant to go with the verses before it. So let me read these verses all together so you can hear how this verse ties in with the previous verses. Beginning at verse 8, but we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. Last week, we looked at all these previous verses, except verse 11. Now this verse, even though it it is so tied into the previous verses that when it stands by itself, it's an incomplete sentence. Yet this tail end verse here, there's some really important things in it that we need to look at. So I think we need to just, we need to look at this before we move on any further. And so listen again to this incomplete sentence. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. Paul starts out here with this interesting phrase, according to the glorious gospel. Notice he doesn't just say according to the gospel. He says according to the glorious gospel. Now the context is, is Paul is an older man by this time. He's an old pastor, and he's talking to a young pastor. And he wants to make sure that Timothy, this young pastor, knows that this gospel is glorious. That word glorious is in there for a reason. Paul wanted to emphasize it. The word glorious comes from the word doxa. We just sang the doxology. The Greek word is doxa. Doxa means praise, honor, glory, brightness, majesty. And so Paul was letting young Timothy know, and he's letting us know, that the gospel is a glorious gospel. It's praiseworthy. It's to be honored. It's majestic. Think for a moment of how God's glory shines forth in his creation. This time of the year, it's so beautiful outside. It's so beautiful to see the color of the leaves. There's still some green out there, and red, and orange, and yellow, and it's beautiful. It's glorious. It's majestic. It's full of brightness. It's so wonderful just to drive and just look around and just see God's beauty. And so we can see the glory of God in the creation. On a starry, moonlit night, we can see the glory of God when we look up into the night sky and see millions and millions of stars in the the Milky Way. And to think that every one of them stars is probably as big or bigger than our sun is just majestic. It's glorious. It's amazing. But there's something that's even more glorious than God's creation, and that is God's glorious gospel. Paul uses the word glorious gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is glorious. It's filled with majesty. Let me give you some reasons. There's more than I'm going to list. But let me give you some reasons why God's gospel is so glorious. The gospel is glorious because it demonstrates the love and the grace and the mercy of God towards man. The gospel is glorious because it's our salvation. The gospel is glorious because it's originated from God himself. 
The gospel is glorious because it is the greatest news on this earth. The gospel is glorious because it is the redemption of mankind. The gospel is glorious because it reconciles sinful man to God himself. The gospel is glorious because Christ conquered sin and death and the devil and hell on the cross. The gospel is glorious because Jesus rose from the dead. The gospel is glorious because through it we are washed, we are cleansed, we are forgiven, we are saved. And so Paul uses the words, the glorious gospel. Now let's just go a bit further in this verse and we're going to see some more uh, words that Paul is trying to emphasize to Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Blessed God. Paul wants to make sure Timothy just hears these words, blessed God. The word blessed means happy. Matthew Henry says, God is infinitely happy in the enjoyment of himself and his own perfections. God is blessed in himself, in his perfect attributes. We probably don't think of that too often, but God is blessed, that is, he's happy in himself, he's pleased in his own perfections, he is, he is at all times delighted in his own glorious attributes. And God is benevolent, that is, he is filled with perfection and he spills it out onto us. He shares his joy and his happiness with us. And so we see Paul, as he writes this letter to young Timothy, one pastor to another, we see Paul full of zeal, full of passion, using these great words, Timothy, the gospel is glorious and God is blessed. So Paul really lets us know, and he lets Timothy know his excitement his enthusiasm, his passion for the Lord and for the gospel. He says, the glorious gospel, the blessed God. Now, there's something else in this verse that we need to see, something really important. Listen to what Paul says next. 1 Timothy 1.11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. Paul says here that he was entrusted with this glorious gospel. The, the Lord gave this glorious gospel to Paul. He entrusted it to Paul to take it, to preach it, to teach it, to share it, to spread it to the world. And Paul probably wondered many times, how could I be entrusted with so amazing of a gospel? How could the blessed God look upon me with so much love and favor that he would just hand this to me, that he would entrust this gospel to me. And so Paul considered it to be the greatest of honors to be entrusted with the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Now, what does it mean to be entrusted with the gospel? The Apostle Paul was entrusted with this glorious message that Christ died for our sins. He was entrusted to teach it, to preach it, to share it, to proclaim it, to spread it to others. And he was entrusted to be faithful with it. That is, he was entrusted to not add to it, not subtract from it, not change it in any way. Man didn't invent the gospel. The gospel didn't come about by any human reasoning or imagination or invention. The gospel originated completely from God. It was God's plan that Jesus would come to this world and that he would die for our sins and rise again from the dead and make a way for us to be saved. It was God's plan that Jesus would be the Savior of all those who would place their trust in him. And so the gospel is God's message of good news to this world. And since it's God's message, to be entrusted with it means we don't change it at all. We don't add to it. We don't subtract from it. We just simply proclaim it. What an amazing thing that is that God entrusted Paul with this message. And what an amazing thing it is that God in, continues to entrust sinful men with this glorious message. He could have given it to angels to give to us, but he gave it to men. 
And so, because the gospel's been entrusted to ministers to faithfully proclaim it, ministers are actually called stewards. A steward is someone who has been entrusted with something to take care of it. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, In this case, moreover, it's required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. And so, as stewards entrusted with the gospel, ministers, again, must be, they must be found trustworthy. We're not to change it. We're not to add to it. We're not to subtract from it. We are simply to take what God has given to us in his word and faithfully proclaim it. It's God's message. It's God's message, and we're to proclaim it. I got to tell you, as a pastor of Cross Point Church, uh, I count it an amazing privilege to be able to stand in this pulpit and proclaim God's word. It's, it is a privilege. And uh, I'm going to get teary eyed now. You know, this Sunday, Raleigh mentioned this, this is this Sunday, 25 years ago, that God gave me the privilege of standing in this pulpit. And by His mercy and grace, I've been here ever since. And uh, I'm just amazed by that. I, I, I just counted a privilege. And uh, yeah, I, I, I counted a privilege to be able to stand in this pulpit and just proclaim God's word. And at the same time, I, I wouldn't dare to come into this pulpit and preach anything else. I just wouldn't dare to, other than God's word, because it's a trust. It's a trust. And every minister and every missionary knows that this is a, a, a trust. God has entrusted his ministers and his missionaries and his evangelists, trusted them to be faithful, to teach, to preach his word, to add nothing, to take away nothing. And that's what we're to do. And as a church, as a church, how much grace do we need as a church to be found faithful in this great Trust as a church, every teacher, every leader, every elder, every person who serves here in any capacity, we all must be stewards, faithful to teach the word of God. We must always and only preach the gospel and the word of God. We mustn't add to it. We mustn't subtract from it. We must not take things out or Put anything in that's not there. We need to be faithful to God's word, amen? Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. Christian, you have been given, not just ministers, but you have been given this glorious gospel. You've been taught it. You've read it. And you've been entrusted with it. You're to be faithful to share it, to proclaim it, to not add to it, to not subtract from it, to be faithful with this message that you've been given, to be a good steward of the gospel, amen? Well, let's go to the next verse. 1 Timothy 1.12. Again, remember the context is Paul, an older pastor by this time, is speaking to Timothy, a brand new young pastor. And so Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. And so Paul is telling Timothy how thankful he is that the Lord Jesus Christ strengthened him for the ministry and considered him faithful and put him into the ministry at all. Paul was thankful to be a pastor, a missionary. And every pastor and every missionary Every evangelist, every elder, they should be thankful that God has put them in the ministry. And so he was thankful that God put them into service. And from this verse, we learn some things about the ministry. For instance, it is Christ who puts men into the ministry. In 1 Timothy 1.12, it says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Those last four words, putting me into service. It's Christ who put Paul into service, and it's Christ who puts his ministers into service. 
Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher from the 1800s, you've all heard of him if you've been in this church for any length of time. Charles Spurgeon used to say to his ministers and to young men who were considering ministry, he used to say to them, if you can possibly help it, don't be a minister. That's what he used to say to them. I don't know if I'm saying it word for word, but pretty close to a quote. If you can possibly help it, don't be a minister. And the reason why he said that, because he knew that if God calls you into the ministry, you will go. You will be compelled to go. You won't be able to help it because God's call is effectual. When he calls, you come. And so he was saying, try not to come. Because if you can't help it, you know God is taking you there. Amen? It's Christ who puts his ministers in place. And furthermore, it's Christ who causes his ministers to be faithful. Paul said he considered me faithful. And yet Paul would have known when he said those words, he considered me faithful. Paul would have known and Paul would have acknowledged the fact that he was faithful. It's because Christ made him faithful. Christ appoints his ministers. He gives them strength. He gives them faithfulness. He holds them in his hands. Revelation 1 talks about Christ in the midst of the lampstands holding the seven stars in his hands. And the seven stars are the angels of the churches. Angels means messengers. That verse is talking about Christ holding his ministers in his hands. As a pastor, I got to tell you, I love that verse. I love that verse. Now, Paul was very thankful that Christ had appointed him to be a minister of the gospel and even amazed. Listen to what he says in verse 13. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Paul, before God saved him, Paul was called Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And the Bible doesn't exactly say you know, we see this name change from Saul to Paul, and it doesn't exactly say why that happened. And so it's just speculation, but it makes me wonder if he just wanted to be so rid of his past that he even changed his name. I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But now, he was, now he's Paul, but he was Saul. Saul was a Pharisee, a very high-ranking Jew, and he hated the Christians. I mean, he saw them as a new sect a sect that would hurt Judaism. He saw the Christians as worshiping a false Messiah. He did not believe that Jesus was the true Messiah, not at all. In fact, he had a rage against the Christians. He didn't just hate the Christians. He acted on his hatred. He went from town to town hunting for Christians. He was hunting for them. And then he would find them and he would bind them, he would arrest them, and he would march them off to prison. Well, look what happened to him in verse 13 as it continues. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Paul says he was shown mercy because he had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And though he had been a blasphemer and a persecutor, yet the grace of God was more than sufficient to forgive Paul of all the wicked sins he had done. The grace of God was more than abundant to wash and cleanse Paul of all of his sins and put him into God's service. Well, listen to what happened to Paul. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Acts 9-1, that's great. If you want to just listen, that's fine. But I want, to, I want to show you what happened to Paul, this persecutor, this violent aggressor against Christ. Listen to what happened to him. Acts 9, verse 1. And I, I like the sound of Bible pages turning. You know, these new apps, they just don't sound the same, do they? Someone's got to make an app that when you turn to Scripture, it'll sound like you're turning to Scripture. <laughs> It's a beautiful sound. Acts 9-1. Now Saul was 
Now Saul's still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. I mean, look at those words. Breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he, he goes to the high priest and he gets letters even that give him authority to arrest any Christian he sees in Damascus. I mean, just think of those words, breathing threats and murder. So Paul's filled with hatred. And so he was going to Damascus to literally hunt down Christians. And so he's traveling. Verse 3, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So there he's just going along to Damascus, breathing hatred, and this light just hits him, enough to knock him down. And then he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This verse teaches us that when someone persecutes the church, when someone persecutes Christians, they are actually persecuting Jesus Christ himself. It was Jesus who said, why are you persecuting me? You know, it's a serious thing to persecute the church, isn't it? Because you're persecuting Christ himself. Verse 5 continues, and he says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, Paul didn't know that he was persecuting Christ. He didn't know it, that that's who was speaking to him, but he sure found out. He sure found out. Now listen as we continue. Look at verse 6. Jesus speaks again, but get up and enter the city, and I will be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So Paul has this amazing experience. He traveled from this place where he had this experience to Damascus, being led by the hand, because he couldn't see, he was blind. And he didn't eat, and he didn't drink, and he sat there. Now there was a disciple, verse 10, at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have I've heard from many about this man. How much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. And so Paul had been such a persecutor, such an aggressor of the church, that even the Christians in this other city, away from Jerusalem, these Christians in Damascus had heard of him. His name preceded him. He was that much of a persecutor, and they were afraid of him. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And so Paul was a blasphemer and a persecutor of the church, and now a chosen instrument of God. God can take the worst of men and he can take the worst of women and he can turn them into his chosen instruments. So Paul was a persecutor of the church, a blasphemer, but the Lord stopped him cold in his tracks and saved him. That's an amazing thing. Christian, we never know whom God is going to save, do we? We never know whom God is going to save. God can take a person whom you would think 
would never come to Christ, and God can take that person and save him to the uttermost. If you think, uh, well, if you know someone who you think, well, they would never come to Christ. If, if you know someone like that, you're thinking, that person, that would, they would never come to Christ. You know what? You're right. They never would come, come to Christ. But that doesn't mean Christ won't come to them. Christ went to Paul and saved him. And if you're saved this morning, it's because Christ went to you and saved you. And if you have a friend who you think would never come to Christ, you're right. You're right. They never would. They never will. But Christ might go to them. Because you know what? That's how all of us get saved. That's how all of us get saved. We wouldn't go to Christ. Christ came to us, just like he came to Paul. And so pray for people Pray for people who you think would never get saved. Pray for them because it's Christ who goes to them. Christ can melt any heart, can he? He can, he can break any heart of stone. Now let's go to the next verse. Look at verse 15. So again, Paul is speaking to young Timothy. And he says this, it is a trustworthy statement. A trustworthy statement. Deserving Full acceptance. Now those are some powerful words. He says to young Timothy, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. In other words, take what I'm going to say and accept it and believe it. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. I wonder what Timothy thought when he heard that. This, this mentor he looks up to this great pastor, this great preacher. And he says, I am the foremost, I am the chief of sinners. Well, Paul is so amazed that Jesus came to him, that Jesus saved him, and he proclaims, Christ came to the world to save sinners. And then he says, among whom I am foremost of all. Well, Christ did come to save sinners. That's his whole mission. And Paul emphasizes how serious Jesus is in saving sinners by saying, in essence, he saved me, and I'm the worst of all. Now, why would Paul say that he is the foremost of all? I've often wondered about that. I, I, I don't know for sure, but here's what, I, here's what I think it is. I have to ask Paul someday in heaven why he said this. The Lord inspired him to say it. Why did Paul say he was the foremost of sinners, the chief of sinners? I think it's because of this. He did such a heinous thing. You know what Paul did? Paul tried to stop the gospel. Paul tried to stop the church. Paul tried to extinguish the work that Christ started. Paul tried to end the church of Jesus Christ. And that was a heinous sin and yet, Jesus saved him. You think about this for a minute. Paul tried to stop the church. And then he said, I am the chief of sinners. What does that mean then when people, even today in the United States, are trying to stop the church? How serious of a thing is it to stop the church. It's a big deal. It's the Lord's church. And yet Jesus saved him. Jesus came to save sinners and he proved it by saving Saul who became Paul who is the chief of sinners. Look at the next verse, 16. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. 
Paul goes on to tell us why Jesus saved him. He says, in essence, I'm putting words in his mouth, I'm paraphrasing, but this is, in essence, what he was saying. I found mercy so that people could see that Jesus is patient and that he can and will save even the worst of sinners. If he can save me, he can save you. That's what he's saying. Do you consider yourself to be the worst of sinners? Do you look at your life and think, how could God save me? If that's you, then you're in good company because you're in company with Paul. And God's mercy and grace is more than abundant. It was more than abundant enough to save Paul, and it's more than abundant enough to save you. The Lord can save you. Just turn to him. Well, let me bring this sermon to a, a conclusion Let me make a list of you, a list for you of the things that we learn in these passages. Eight eight simple things. Number one, Paul rightly teaches us that the gospel is glorious. Amen? Gospel is glorious. Number two, the Bible also says God is blessed. God is blessed. That is, he is happy in himself and his perfections. Infinitely happy in himself. And he shares his happiness with us. Number three, Paul was thankful to have been put into God's service. And so whatever ministry God has put you in, count it a privilege, because it is, and be thankful. Number four, the gospel is a trust. The gospel is a trust. It's been entrusted to us, and we're to be faithful stewards with it, not adding to it, not subtracting from it, but faithfully proclaiming it. Number five, Paul was put in the ministry by the Lord. The Lord who is the Lord is the one who puts his people into service. Be thankful for being able to serve the Lord in whatever ministry he's placed you in, because he is the one who placed you in it. Number six, the Lord came to Paul. Paul did not come to the Lord. And that's how it is if you're saved. The Lord came to you. Number seven. Nevertheless, we are told in Scripture to invite people to come to Christ. And so we invite people. Turn to the Lord. Turn to Christ. And yet we know that if they do, it's because Christ came to them. Number eight. Paul states that he is the worst of sinners, the chief, the foremost, meaning that if Christ's grace and mercy are abundant enough to save Paul, Christ's grace and mercy is abundant enough to save you and to save me. And so turn to Christ. Believe the glorious gospel that Christ died for your sins. He came to this world to save sinners. If you are a sinner, He came to save you. Turn to him and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the glorious gospel that you have given to us. We thank you for salvation, and we thank you for entrusting this message to us. Lord, help us to be faithful in proclaiming it, in sharing it, and teaching it, and preaching it. Lord, may may we not add to it or take away from it, but be faithful stewards. And Father, we just thank you that your grace and your mercy is so abundant that it can save the worst of sinners. Lord, if there's someone here today who needs your saving grace, Father, we pray you just go to them and give them your salvation. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.